Welcome everybody to today's webinar called Climate Change and Water Scarcity. We are very honored today to have Professor Dr. Eddie Morse. He is Rector of IHG Delft Institute for Water Education. And before I'm handing over to him, I will briefly explain you something about the setup of the webinar. So my name is Lenneke Knoop. I'm from the Water Channel. And um, this webinar is part of the webinar series organized by IHG Delft in cooperation with the Water Channel for alumni. So a very warm welcome to all of you. I see many of us are already online. Um, what we can do today is this webinar is an interactive webinar and you are welcome to share your uh, questions in the chat box. In the corner bottom at the right you will see this chat box. You can post your questions there throughout the whole webinar and we will compile them during the webinar. After the presentation of Eddie Morse, we will post the questions one by one, one to him and he will answer them for you. Then finally, I would like to ask you if you can share your name and your expertise also in the chat box. So in order for us to have an idea who is actually here in the room today. And um, all recordings will be shared later on on the waterchannel.tv and on the website of IHC Delft. So today's webinar is about climate change. I don't think the topic needs a lot of introduction, but I'm very happy and honored to introduce to you Professor Eddie Morse. And besides being a rector of IHC Delft, he also holds the position of Professor of Water and Climate at the University in Amsterdam. He started his career actually at the World Meteorological Organization, working in Africa and the Caribbean. And before coming to Delft, he also worked at the Wageningen University and Research Center. Having a background in hydrology and climate change, the present focus of his research is on the occurrence of trends and extremes, as well as on measures to mitigate these extremes. And this is actually where I would like to hand over to Professor Eddie Morse to present about the things I just mentioned. Eddie, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Lenneke. And, uh I'm very honored that uh, I have the opportunity actually to say a few words about climate change and water scarcity. Uh, what uh, Lenneke asked is uh, if you have any questions to post those questions, uh, but I must say I have some questions myself as well. So besides uh, having questions from your side, I would also be very interested to know about your suggestions and maybe answers that you may have to some of the questions that I will post during my presentation. So what I would like uh, to do is uh, I would like uh, to start by introducing a couple of definitions because I know that sometimes you have uh, different views when using the same words. And then I would uh, like to spend a few words on climate change. Like Lenneke already said, I think climate change is something that everybody appreciates and uh, have different opinions about. Uh, so I would like to indicate a few developments that uh, I would like to share with you then say something about impacts and possible options for a way forward. So first, uh, the definitions. Uh, one is uh, water scarcity. Um, so the way how I use the word uh, water scarcity is uh, the lack of sufficient available water resources to meet water needs within a region. And uh, that means that it uh, may affect uh, say every continent. And I, I do think a large number of people is impacted by water scarcity already and what we see is and believe is that that uh, impact will become greater over the years to come. Then uh, water scarcity uh, I think you can uh, say split up in two main mechanisms. One is a uh, one that's more physical so absolute water scarcity and the second one is economic water scarcity. And connected to that, I think that the perceptions of uh, the stakeholders, so the, the people who are experiencing a possible shortage of water, is very important. So that's why I put in the, the symbolic design on the right-hand side to show you that even looking at the two-dimensional picture, you could still have a different impression on what you see in a picture. So I think it's very important to share one another's perceptions. To work a little bit uh, further on the definition of uh, uh, scarcity, often we also talk about drought. Now, if you talk about drought, if you look at the two boxes that I um, depicted here in this one, on the left-hand side you have physical water scarcity, and on the right-hand side you have economic water scarcity. Now, within physical water scarcity, I think we're talking about a couple of different sorts of droughts, and those droughts are mainly linked to 
say, the causes why those droughts are happening. So one important one is uh, what we call a hydrological drought. A hydrological drought is where we have a shortage of uh, surface water. Another one is, uh, I say, the meteorological droughts. And with meteorological droughts, uh, we often just look at precipitation and precipitation deficits. Those two are influencing actually the agrohydrological droughts or ecological droughts. And uh, that drought is the drought that is being experienced uh, because of a shortage of soil, soil water deficit. And uh, that you see reflected often in yields or in uh, vegetational ecosystems uh, that are experiencing a water shortage. Then uh, another drought that you may have is uh, an, an uh, other hydrological drought, and that drought is not caused by surface water shortage, but by groundwater deficit. And both uh, groundwater deficits as well as the agrohydrological agro drought are depending on antecedent uh, water storage. So the storage term is, is very important in there. Of course, it can also be a surface water storage, uh, but it can also be groundwater storage. The most important, I think, is the economic water scarcity, which is on your right-hand side, where water demand is uh, being, say, created through our socio-economic uh, socio drought. So the water demand, the, the stakeholder, is playing a very important part. And I think if you start talking about drought, it's about how drought is being perceived by uh, the end user. So it could well be that the farmer is experiencing a drought, well, maybe somebody who's interested in, in, in a forest uh, is not experiencing that drought. Or that an, a water resource manager is experiencing a drought because he's also responsible for transportation, so to have enough water in the rivers, while for the farmer at that moment in time it's still not a drought. So I think it's very important to uh, decide which user uh, you are addressing when you're talking about the drought. Then about climate change. Uh, of course, climate change is very much uh, related to CO2 emissions, and uh, this is a graph that shows actually the, the latest uh, review on how much CO2 emissions uh, are there. Uh, that always lags behind a year because you need the reporting. So as you see in here, it's until 2016. And uh, what you also see is that um, what we experience is a, a flattening of uh, the rise of uh, CO2 emissions, which uh, is a good sign. An important uh, role in there is uh, because of the, the Chinese switching uh, slowly from other uh, energy sources and are reducing the amount of coal that they are using. So that's a very important development. And of course, most interesting is if we can curve this uh, say, stabilized uh, level that we're seeing at the moment towards a decline in uh, the future. That means that uh, we are talking about uh, mitigation of um, uh, climate change. And in mitigation side, uh, the energy is a very important one because uh, the emissions from the energy is there. Uh, you can separate that in two parts. Uh, one on the right-hand side, uh, you see the cost of the electricity and on the left hand side is the energy generation and of course demand is the, the third uh, player in this picture but if you look at the energy generation on the left hand side you see that we are already experiencing a decline in fossil fuels and that we see an increase for example in more sustainable energy sources like uh, solar then if you look at the right hand side and that's very important is that you also see uh, i think an important uh, trend in the cost of uh, electricity so you see an increase in, for example, oil or nuclear or, or uh, coal energy sources, while you see a stabilizing of wind energy and you see a decline in uh, solar energy. And so this combination of a decline in cost of energy together with uh, an increase in um, energy generation, I think is an, a good driver to make a change in uh, what we are presently using for energy sources. So I think this is a positive uh, development, but even with this development in place, and if you look at, uh, say, the commitments that were done at the Paris Agreement uh, two years ago and how they are implemented, we will not succeed with the present, uh, say, commitments uh, to reduce the amount of CO2 that's emitted to reduce the effects of climate change. So that means that uh, for the future climate, and especially for the first 50 years to come, we have to consider uh, the changes that are ahead. And if uh, you look here, then you see in the right-hand box 
uh, you see some of the predictions and projections that are there. Um, we now talk about RCPs, and those RCPs are actually re reflecting the level of uh, CO2 emissions and what that means for temperature increase. And so the highest RCP is, say, around 8, and the lowest is around 2. And what we would like to achieve as an international community is a one and a half degree increase in temperature change. And for that one, uh, we have to increase our commitments to reduce our energy quite a lot. So the message is that we're still not there, so that we should take into account possible adaptation. Adaptation is based on, uh, say, some of the main drivers. Uh, two of them are one temperature and the other one precipitation. And there you can think about average temperature or total changes in precipitation. But for a lot of sectors, it's more important what happens with derivatives of uh, those two main drivers. So on the two left-hand uh, boxes, uh, what you see is changes in temperature. And in this case, it's about, uh, for example, um, say the maximum temperature or minimum temperature. An example why that is important is uh, if you want to recover actually from a warm day, that means that you need a good night uh, rest, and a good night rest very much depends if temperature goes above, say, 27, 30 degrees to enable you to recover. So on the right-hand side, you see uh, some indicators for precipitation, and those are linked, in this case, to an, an excess uh, of water. Uh, one is indicating, uh, say, a total increase in heavy rainfall showers, and another one is showing an increase in the number of days that you may have such uh, heavy showers. And as uh, you probably know, uh, if you are talking about flood events, a flood is not depending on the total amount of rain in a year, but it very much depends on how much water is falling in how much time in which place. So I think information like that is very important to know uh, what you can do. The impacts of uh, those issues, and I just give one example here that comes from the IPCC uh, report, from the Fifth Assessment Report, uh, sometimes uh, can be depicted uh, using, uh, say, images like this, and it shows actually a little bit about how much uh, emphasis uh, we can put on the impacts for different sectors of those changes in climate. And it shows for the different regions where uh, we think at the moment that the, the hotspots are for those uh, changes. But it also shows a little bit about how much confidence we can have in what comes from those uh, projections. So I think this is very helpful if you start talking with uh, stakeholders about what a possible impact of climate change may be. Then it's not only climate change, there are also some other drivers that are important to take into consideration, and I think they are related. So one of them is urbanization, and I just took one picture here to show how uh, urbanization is going to increase. And if you look at the global level, that uh, line shows you also a little bit what's happening in the different continents, and you can see that we expect for 2017 that uh, more than 50% of the population on uh, the globe is living in urban areas and by 2050 it will rise to 65 percent. And so how we're dealing with our urbanization and what's happening in cities is very important to know how to arrange, say, our resources. Now one of those resources is groundwater. And I just took one picture here from Iran. This is a um, uh, uh, groundwater aquifer uh, close to Mashhad in Iran, and what you see is that if you look at the long um, year trend, that the groundwater is lowering by about half a meter per year. And this is not an exception. You see that in a, in a lot of continents happening. And why this is important is that because uh, groundwater is uh, one of uh, the reservoirs uh, that are, uh, say, there, and we can use them if we use it in a sustainable way to overcome a period of water shortage. So it is a possible mitigation uh, measure or opportunity to overcome, say, water scarcity. Now, if you look at uh, what is being perceived uh, by the Economic Forum, and this is their latest report from 2018, and this is on perception of uh, risk, and then uh, you see in this graph on uh, the x-axis the likelihood of certain uh, risks, while on the y-axis you see the impact. And so if you look at the right-hand corner, uh, there you have uh, those events that are, say, um, having the biggest likelihood, 
and also the biggest impact. If you look at the left hand side at the table, and then you see, uh, say on the first table, uh, the likelihood. You see the five events that are considered as most likely to happen. And this table just below that on the impact says something about which ones may have the highest impact. Just to name a couple of them, uh, the first one is, um, say, the emerging um, or the mitigation of uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation of climate change. Another one, and that's on the impact side, on the, on the bottom side, you see uh, water crisis, and you also see a couple of other, uh, say, events that uh, may happen. Um, we will share the slides later on because so I acknowledge that, uh, say, the symbols in the graph are a bit small for you to read. But uh, one uh, other maybe interesting one is uh, the one that you uh, see in, in, the, in the corner over here. And that says uh, a little bit about uh, possible uh, conflict and mass destruction uh, that may happen. But uh, here the, you see that the impact is high, but the likelihood is, I think, luckily considered to be low. Now, what's in the news at the moment, and I think if you have been following the news, then uh, one of them is uh, what's happening in Cape Town. And in Cape Town, it's experiencing the third year in a row uh, a, a drought. And why is this one uh, interesting is uh, because um, it's an expectation if they don't receive uh, water soon, uh, they may end up in an, a real crisis uh, by the beginning of uh, April. And um, if you uh, look at, um, let's say, this slide here that depicts a little bit uh, about the precipitation in Cape Town. Then you also see that actually April is the month that the rains uh, will start and that the periods before that are uh, the months with a low in uh, precipitation. That means for that period, uh, people really depend about uh, what's available in uh, water storage. And Cape Town very much depends actually on surface water storage. And there, uh, in, in a number of years, uh, the surface water storage has not been replenished uh, enough to overcome uh, this uh, normal period uh, where you have, uh, let's say, a limited uh, number of rains. Um, of course, Cape Town is not, uh, say, the only town that's experiencing uh, this. Uh, if you uh, look um, a bit uh, further, actually, and we'll come back uh, to that. There are other cities that are also experiencing or have experienced droughts as well, not always for the same reasons. Why well, I think it's important uh, to look at uh, what's happening with uh, climate change is that uh, what we see with climate change that there is a shift in precipitation patterns, both in time and in space. This is an example of India. On the right-hand side here, you see actually say when uh, the onset of the monsoon is there and of course that's in the agricultural sense a very important uh, starting date to know when you should start uh, sowing your crop but what uh, you also see in this graph over here these are the months of the years and the different colors uh, the different uh, say crops are depicted but you see that depending on the crop there's a different uh, say dependency on uh, different water resources so if this is time, and if you now uh, get an, uh, a shift, uh, say, in uh, when, uh, for example, the temperature is going to increase, you will get a shift in the availability of meltwater, and that's especially in the Indus, but also partly in the upstream of the Ganges important. Uh, so uh, availability of water due to melt of the Himalayas uh, will uh, be become available earlier in time, that will be limited later in time. So that means that there is a shift of the availability of water. And um, another possibility is that there is a shift in uh, precipitation patterns so coming from the, the monsoons in this region. And if this one shifts to the right, that also means that in uh, the period that you will have less uh, monsoon uh, precipitation available, that you also have to think about if you should and are able to supply a rainfall depending a crop uh, with uh, and surface water reservoir or groundwater reservoir available water, or if you should shift uh, to another land use or another cropping pattern. Like I said, there are also other cities, and here's just a list uh, from a an, an, uh, newspaper clipping coming uh, from the BBC. And there are 11 cities listed here. I will not go over them. Uh, but what you see in this list is that uh, this what's happening in Cape Town is not an, an, a single event that's happening there. 
that similar events are happening in other cities, but causes are sometimes different. And so, for example, that uh, if you look at uh, Bangladesh, uh, there, uh, besides having, uh, in some cases, a shortage of uh, water, uh, it's uh, mainly uh, the water quality. The same is happening in Bangalore, uh, which is a city with a lot of lakes around it, but the water quality of the lakes is an important issue why a part of the water that is available can't be used, for example, for drinking water or in some cases not even for agricultural purposes. You see this water quality issue coming back in a number of other cities and I think it's an increasing uh, problem that we are facing, but not everybody is aware of this uh, issue. Then talking about ways forward, now one of them is uh, to increase water productivity because as you know the agricultural sector is a very important water user, that's why I also gave this example from India about shifts in water availability. If we are able to increase water productivity in the agricultural sector and we are able to use this water for different purposes, we may be able to at least reduce uh, the risk of uh, water shortage like what's happening now in Cape Town. Another way forward would be to restore the response function of the soil. That can either be, uh, say, the surface soil, which is important for agricultural purposes, but also for our natural terrestrial ecosystem. Or we can try to increase, actually, our aquifer capacity hold, to hold water and to have this water available to overcome periods of drought. Alternative water supplies, and uh, you could think about uh, water treatment and the reuse of water. It could also be desalination. Uh, possibilities are another way forward that we could develop. But I think very important is also that um, cities and, and regions are prepared for droughts. So that means that drought management and having drought management plans available before a drought start, and let's start the discussion when the drought is there, but that you take the adequate measures, say at the beginning when you expect a drought, instead of when you are in a drought, I think is very important. And I would like to invite you to come up with uh, other ways forward because I do think that there is no single solution for all the problems that we are facing. Just to emphasize that a little bit, uh, I here give an example on, on water demand. And uh, what you see in this graph here is uh, water uh, abstraction and water use. And uh, one example is actually from the energy sector. Uh, the energy sector has uh, an, a big uh, water abstraction and that's because of the cooling facilities that they need for water with a small water use and then in some cases you may say okay then that's not that such a big issue but uh, i think it's good to know that in a number of cases uh, this water use increases the temperature of the water and by increasing the temperature they in impact the aquatic an ecological value of the surface water and in some cases they are then not allowed to discharge the water anymore. So if that happens that means that they have to stop operating and actually uh, a number of years ago a situation like that almost happened in uh, Europe where uh, during a um, uh, heat wave uh, it was very close to stop the operation of uh, the energy uh, producing facilities and if something like that happens you can assume that a lot of uh, this may have an impact. Also, because some of the other uh, water uses are agriculture and uh, industry, but also drinking water, and they very much depend on energy. So we need energy uh, to have that available as well, to assure that we can distribute water, and that we can treat water, and that we can make water available at the right place and the right time. So this connection to the energy is a very strong and important link, and how we can uh, reduce the amount of energy that's being used also has an impact on, say, climate mitigation. So can we reduce also the greenhouse gas emissions from the amount of energy that we're using? So making, uh, for example, uh, water treatment facilities more energy efficient is uh, something I think is an important part to look at. Then I think both in the energy sector, but also, for example, if you're looking at the agricultural sector, it's good to, in some cases, also think about the supply chain or the production chain. Uh, because in there, first of all, of course, you can think about efficiency improvement, which is always a nice thing if you have a business that you operate, because that may improve your revenues that you get from uh, your business. But it is also a way how you can uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I think an important one is, is these are all about energy efficiencies that you could improve in different parts of the production chain. But I think the demand management also for a production chain, so that's also about 
uh, what we are eating, so our diet is playing a role in there about how much energy and water we are using in the different sectors. And that's also true for all the other occasions. So I think, I think looking at the supply chain, uh, if you're thinking about how you can uh, mitigate uh, water problems is an important uh, starting point. Now, like I said, I have some questions as well. So here are my questions to you. Is, uh, can we provide seasonal drought scarcity forecasts? At the moment, if you look at our seasonal forecast in some regions, like uh, in Africa, uh, we can say something about it, but then you still have to think about something like, uh, say, a sort of yes-no, or, or maybe a 30% uh, accuracy about those uh, forecasts, not more than that. And I think looking at what's happening at uh, Cape Town, uh, we are in an urgent need to improve those forecasts. So how can we do that, and are we able to do that? The second one is, um, um, if we're talking about droughts, so water shortage, I think we should also consider the fact that in a lot of cases we also are thinking about floods. And if you look at what's happening with climate change, in a lot of regions we see both, uh, so a reduction of water in certain periods, but also we see an increase in the intensity of showers in uh, another period. So that may mean that uh, the overall change in precipitation over the year may be not that big, but the distribution of precipitation very much addresses an issue where we should think about uh, drought and uh, flood mitigation. The third question is, can we increase the response capacity of landscapes? And uh, there you could think about, uh, for example, the, the Cap de Promille proposal that was done by France uh, during the negotiations and uh, the last COP in Paris, where uh, we would like to increase uh, the organic matter in the topsoil uh, to enable the soils to better capture moisture that's falling, so using, uh, say, precipitation that's falling. The second important part in there is if you improve the hydraulic characteristics of the soil, you can also improve the infiltration characteristics. And I think that's not only true for agriculture, but it's very much also true for cities. So how can we assure that in cities that we don't close off the surface, but that we actually allow water to enter the soil and also to keep it there so we can use it in a period of drought? Of course, there are limits there, so that's where the feedback is to the flood system. But I think uh, another important part is can we manage our demands? So demand management, both of water, but also on, on food, on, on uh, energy, I think is a very important uh, player that we should look at. Then, uh, of course, if you talk about demand management, it's about how do we engage with stakeholders. Uh, there are differences in perceptions, like I said, so how can you address that? And uh, how do we finance the mitigation measures? Uh, so financing both uh, to do an investment, but also how can we build a business model to assure a good operation and maintenance of the investments that we make are, I think, uh, important topics, especially in the water sector. And then uh, the last part is, uh, do we have enough time to implement these measures? So if you look at large measures, and if you look at the decision, and if you look at the regulations that we have there, Often implementation measures can take uh, even decades to be implemented. So do we have this time or are the changes going faster than that or should we look maybe at a different way? And then I think we are starting to talk about governance, how we can speed up this implementation of measures. So I think the overall question is how do we share our waters now and in the future? And uh, having said that, I think coming back to this risk assessment, uh, my opinion is that uh, what I think that uh, if you now look at what's happening, for example, in Cape Town, that we see this water crisis that is moment depicted here on this uh, likelihood and impact uh, chart, that it will move up and that it will become a bigger, uh, say, risk and that it may have a bigger impact in the future. And I'm not sure that everybody is aware about this, so I think it's very urgent that we start spreading the news and we start talking about possible solutions, especially because we need such a long lead time to implement possible mitigation measures. And with uh, that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and open for questions and suggestions. Thank you very much. I will now pull up some questions that we received. And um, thank you everybody also for sending in these questions. What I noticed is that there were a few questions on slides. So I think I put them up first and then I also put a related slide. 
So the first question is on this slide, and I will uh, put the question. There it comes. So Aaron Jan van Bodegom, he asks, could you please explain a bit more um, on the image of the globe on hotspots? Could you explain a bit more? Uh, yeah, could you elaborate a bit further? Um, yes, so what, what it uh, depicts actually a little bit is uh, what you see is, is in the, the corner over here, it explains a little bit the symbols. And uh, what uh, these symbols tell you is a, a bit something about what, uh, say, the likelihood is that something happens. So how much confidence do we have that a certain change may take place? Now, if uh, you then uh, look at uh, the three uh, other symbols that are here, uh, that is by uh, categorizing, uh, say, the different sectors that are there. And uh, what you see in there is also uh, how much of the changes are uh, going to be attributed to climate change. Uh, because, uh, like I said, it's not only about climate change, it's also other changes that are taking place. So uh, we would like to know what the attribution is to climate change. And I think important for that is the discussion that is taking place, for example, about funding, possible solutions. So think about, for example, the Green Climate Fund. Uh, there they really would like to fund uh, possible solutions, but they would like to address climate change. And so there's a big discussion if uh, you should also fund development-oriented uh, improvements. And personally, I think you can't always separate the two, but it's something that you need to address if you want to apply for such funding. Now, if you look at the images uh, in, in the, the boxes over here, uh, they just summarize a little bit on uh, what's happening in the different continents, so give a global view. I think this is an interesting uh, picture because it shows on a global level where what sector is impacted by climate change or by other sectors. And by that, it's giving the global community a very fast overview on, on, on what may happen. And I put this forward because I think, um, say, Having communications and having a good interaction with your stakeholders is very important. And images like this, I can see help in there. Uh, although, of course, it's much too broad to think about uh, possible measures because then you have to zoom in and you have to look at the local conditions and what's locally happening. Thank you for that answer. Very clear. Um, up next was a slide on groundwater depletion. I will put that slide again forward. And then we have two questions related to groundwater. It was about this slide. I'll make them fit a bit better. So first of all, Jose Raul Perez Duran asks, um, declining groundwater levels shown in the example come from over-exploitation, or are they related to reduction in water recharge of aquifers? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. Uh, I think in this case it's a combination of the two. Uh, I, I do think that uh, what, what is very interesting here is uh, the city of Masat is, is uh, an, uh, first of all a big city, but it also has a very big influx of, uh, say, people that uh, come there for speci special celebrations, uh, which put an e extra emphasis actually on the water use in a certain period. And uh, I think in this case, uh, it's, it's difficult to separate uh, the two. Uh, so I, I do think it's an, um, a combined effort. Uh, but uh, the only thing is that climate change you can't change. Uh, the over expectation is where there is a possible way how you could manage and possibly improve actually what's happening here. There is one related question, it's from Saroj, he's from Nepal, and he asks, okay, issues related to groundwater depletion in the context of increasing urbanization. In one hand, you are talking about climate change, and on the other hand, urbanization. In that scenario, how would you relate groundwater depletion with urbanization and climate change? And how do you see the effects of climate change and groundwater depletion in the scenario of increasing urbanization? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's, that's a good question, and I think... Uh, it almost uh, requires a an, an complete uh, research. But let me try to answer a couple of questions because I think they are slightly related. Um, if you talk about uh, cities, and uh, there are, um, say, different issues there. If you talk about delta cities, they are often built on soft soil. Uh, so in uh, that case, with the soft soil, and you extract water for drinking water purposes, you have an added problem 
uh, which is caused by, uh, let's say, the lowering of the surface soil because of this extraction of water. And the lowering of the surface soil sometimes may induce an intrusion of uh, seawater, which may uh, cause an uh, salt water uh, intrusion also in the drinking water system. So that will, um, say, reduce the uh, amount of water that you can use. But if you then talk about uh, a city maybe somewhat higher upstream in the catchment area, again, I think they are linked. Uh, one is that uh, an aquifer is often not restricted to, uh, say, the city boundaries. Uh, so you're talking about the catchment area. And I think if you look at uh, how water is being extracted, uh, you also have a historical pattern. And so what you often see that it will be done close by to the city or in the city, the groundwater system. But then, uh, because the city is growing, so that's where the urbanization takes part, uh, this uh, water is not sufficient anymore. Uh, you can do a, a pretty simple calculation where you look at, say, the amount of square kilometers uh, that the city uh, boundary is encompassing, and you can calculate how much water is forming and how much will be uh, lost due to evaporation, for example, and then you know how much is available in a sustainable way kind of from precipitation. So if you are of extracting from your groundwater system what's coming uh, available there, and then uh, I think you can know already beforehand that your groundwater table is lowering. I think a bigger issue in city areas is the contamination that also takes place in the same city area. So that also means that often uh, the groundwater under a city area is uh, not from the right quality to be used directly for drinking water purposes, meaning that the city will depend say, from the aquifers or the surface water system surrounding the city. And there, with climate change uh, changing uh, the availability of water, and maybe even, uh, the, say, the water coming in a shorter period of time, uh, that means that you really have to either increase your surface water reservoirs, which is not always a good step forward because of the evaporation that takes place from uh, surface water, or there's just not room enough to create such a surface water system. And I think there, restoring the aquifers, sometimes that may take a time, but I think that could be a very sustainable way to develop. So I, I do think that, uh, say, taking better care of our aquifers on the long run is uh, a very important uh, way that we should follow. Thank you for this answer. I hope that will give Saros uh, a start. As you said, it can take a whole research to answer questions like these, but um, thank you very much. The next question is again about one of the slides. It's, I think, it's, yeah, it's this slide. It's uh, a question of Arend Jan van Bogegom. Again, he asks, um, how did you come up with the events? So how are these events um, you know, plotted down? How are they defined or how are they decided? Yeah, th this is, uh, this is um, I think if you really want to, to know the details, I suggest to uh, read the, the report. Uh, I think the source is, is in the bottom of the slide. But uh, this is actually how, uh, say, a number of stakeholders that are interviewed by uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, how they experience and how they think that uh, the risk will develop in 2018. Uh, so it's, it's really built on uh, people's perceptions on uh, what the impact and the likelihood of risks, risks are. Thank you. What we will do, we will also upload the slides later on so people can also see the source because now this is not uh, readable, but we will provide this information. Mm, then those were the questions regarding the slides. Then there are many more questions coming in, luckily. Thank you. Um, I would like to go to another question of Jose Raul. I'll put it up right now. The question is, um, assessment of economic impact is a big challenge when it comes to estimating future trends in prices over long time periods of agricultural produce, for example. Is there some research development that facilitates reaching such estimates or forecasts? Yeah, that's uh, again a good question. I think that, um, that that's difficult to predict. Uh, I, I don't know if you look at the, the stock exchange and uh, you look how that fluctuates because a part of the prices are being determined by the, the world market. Uh, and I think uh, putting your money there uh, will tell you a little bit about how difficult it is. Um, of course, it's not only the world market, uh, uh, partly of uh, the, the prices also on, on uh, local markets. Uh, I do think that um, 
uh, you could inform uh, that maybe on the short term uh, farmers a little bit better about uh, development, but uh, I see a, a big progress there in the use of, of uh, smartphones and, and having the right information available. I think uh, working on that, uh, you should always look on what possibilities a farmer has to change something. And so if you're talking about changing a crop, uh, then uh, first of all, that uh, takes uh, often a growing season at least. Sometimes it also means that the farmer has to change the equipment that he's using, so that means investment, so that will take even longer. And so then he needs uh, predictions from years ahead. Another one uh, that is uh, maybe shorter term could be uh, if he knows something about how much water he may expect, he could think about if the planting distance uh, should be larger because there's less water, or if he can take the risk that he can put it closer together. And I think that's also something to discuss with appreciation and with the information about how prices are developing on the market with this risk information, I think he can make a, a better informed decision on what he can do. And so I see developments there, especially I think with uh, our telecommunication uh, developments, uh, and I think that's going to offer possibilities. And especially I think uh, farmers that are closely located to big cities, urban areas. And so uh, providing food to urban cities, I think there you can do much more with uh, information on, on, and now talking about weather in instead of climate change. But weather information, I, I think, can help a farmer to improve, say, the income that he has. Okay, question related to this, so in, in terms of reaching farmers, um, is one asked by Caterina Marinetti. She says, we have seen that scientists and researchers have produced a wide amount of valuable information in predicting and analyzing the impacts of climate change. And what can be done to translate this even better uh, into better information into advisory systems for end users? So you, you were just already mentioning all these tools and the mobile applications, etc. Is there also something else that you can uh, add to this question specifically? Yeah, I think um, maybe a, a, a little bit of... Um uh, uh, information about risks and how you can deal with risks. I think that's very important for people to appreciate what you can do with climate change. And I think if uh, you can build uh, this risk into your business model uh, as a farmer, for example, I think that can help a farmer. Of course, there are also uh, cases in which um, uh, you, you can't give the precise information that you would like to have. So you also have to deal with that, but I think in that case you should also inform the farmer that that's just not possible uh, to do. And then the farmer can make his decision on uh, maybe other objectives, so how much uh, reserves does, does he has, and uh, what can he do based on that. And so I think uh, giving him clarity about what you can do, but also I think not a yes or no answer, it's about risk assessment and helping him to make this decision, I think that's the most important thing that you can do. So uh, clarifying the risks that are associated to uh, the numbers that you're providing to them in the form of precipitation or temperature changes, I think that's the best uh, contribution that we can supply to the farmers. Yeah. Um, thank you for the answer. And um, I see we have a little bit more time and we also have some questions. Um, but I see some questions are also so uh, yeah, very broad. I think you can write a whole PhD dissertation on that. So you also ask questions to the audience. And I think one comment um, after the questions that you uh, raised was this comment raised by Katarina. And I think uh, it would be good to, to read that out now to also see how the uh, audience responds. So one thing she says, um, let's see if this is the right one, uh, financing resources for mitigation measures, IG and agriculture, are available through governmental or international aid programs. However, their access is often limited for users. There should be an increase in the internal capacity and expertise of local water agriculture managing authorities to foster the implementation of the measures and make them more available to users. So it's a bit also related, in, in my opinion, to her uh, earlier question. But I think this is one of the ideas that she puts forward um, yeah, when you said, okay, how to continue. No, I, I, I fully agree, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we have to work on how we can do this. I think another important part is that uh, if you are introducing measures, you also have to start uh, thinking about how you can support it by uh, making uh, finances available. Uh, I think that 
it's not only about informing the farmers, it's also about informing people who have access to those uh, financial sources on what they can do with that. Right? Because in a number of cases, it will be difficult for a farmer to ask for an investment because uh, the investing agency finds the risk too big or doesn't have the capacity to really appreciate uh, the risk in such a way that he is still able to release those funds for a farmer to indeed uh, say make an improvement that's needed to overcome say the variability that he's experiencing in uh, say the, the meteorological parameters such as temperature and precipitation. One final question that is lined up. I'll put it here. It's one of the questions that it might take more than a webinar to answer. Hmm, the question is from uh, Professor De Wet. I quickly want to copy it. It's about the Himalaya and changing patterns. Um, could you elaborate, I don't know if you know this, a bit more on precipitation shifting patterns of monsoon shifts in the Himalayas? Yes. I, I, yes this is his work field and it's very interesting to know about your opinion on this. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, what uh, what you see happening in uh, the Himalayas, and that's is uh, very strongly related also to changes in um, sea surface uh, temperatures, is that um, in a number of cases uh, the precipitation is uh, starting uh, later uh, in in the year, and uh, in a number of cases uh, that uh, even the total amount of precipitation that's available in uh, the season is reducing. If uh, you look um, at uh, the Himalayas, uh, then uh, if you go from uh, west to east, uh, then uh, the further you go to the eastern side, the more important the uh, monsoon influences is becoming, while in uh, the western side it's, it's more the meltwater that is uh, determining uh, the water availability. So if you then look at uh, the western side, uh, when uh, what precipitation is falling, for example, in uh, the form of snow, uh, that may delay uh, the availability of water, also very much determine how much water becomes available downstream. The way how the patterns, the monsoon patterns, are completely changing, I think that's still very variable. So that means that if you look at the natural variation that you see in there, also in time and space, is as large as what we see in the projections. But what we do see is that this variability is increasing. And I think that's a an, an, an common uh, image that we see. And so uh, the, the intensity is increasing, uh, while the total amount is uh, remaining the same, or sometimes also even increasing a little bit, which uh, would mean that you have more water available. But because of this shift in time and space of the patterns, this water is not always available at the place and time that you would like to have it, at least for the present way how we're using water. Thank you very much for this answer. We are reaching now the final question. Let's make it a bit bigger. Mm, and that question we just received from Darendra Chitata. He asks, what is the potential for experiential learning, like two-way learning, from science policy practice interface in drought mitigation? Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm uh, very much in favor of doing this. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, we should learn better from uh, difficult situations that we're in. I do acknowledge that uh, if such a situation is happening, the first thing you think about is not about uh, research, because you're trying to alleviate the problem. Uh, but I do think that we should try to learn more from uh, those difficult situations. And I think in uh, a case like this, uh, for example, if you look at what's happening in, in Cape Town, uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people who are thinking about possible solutions, and I think it would be really good to find out if we can implement those uh, solutions, have a good observation along that, and see how those solutions have the, the, the highest effect on, uh, say, mitigating problems that uh, no, we are facing over there. Uh, I also think that uh, a number of those solutions may take a number of years, so I think it's good to follow uh, the implementation of those solutions and see if in the long run uh, they still uh, are uh, the best solutions uh, to have in place. So 
I think this two-way learning that I've suggested here, I think that's something where uh, you really need this collaboration between researchers, uh, the politicians, but also, uh, say, the private sector that is implementing uh, certain uh, new technologies, and um, see how we can uh, engage uh, with science uh, policy and practice. Uh, so I, I, I'm very much in favor of, of doing things like that and see how uh, how you can implement uh, certain measures in the field and see if that uh, gives the results that uh, you expect. And I think it should not be a, a, a small pilot. It should be, let's say, as, uh, as big as possible. So you're talking actually about implementing measures instead of doing research. So I think implementing measures is the starting point. But I do think that having research parallel to that to see how effective it is and to learn and adapt while you're implementing the measure would be a great way forward. Yes, thank you very much for this answer. And I think it's uh, very much in line with uh, one of the comments that just has been given by one of the participants. As you also asked some feedback of the participants, I would really like to close the um, webinar um, with his comments, and uh, it's Jose Raúl Pérez Durán who says, to approach adaptation or mitigation in climate change, there are many ideas and proposals that are not different from what we thought about in the past to solutions in the water sector. And one good thing about the climate change perspective is that it brings many things together. And then he ends with saying that maybe climate change needs for complementing ideas or solutions, which we have also thought of in the past. I think that uh, sort of summarizes also your uh, last comment. Yes, very much. <laughs> so yeah. I would like to thank you, Professor Eddie Morris, for answering very diverse uh, questions and being able to address everything. And um, I would like to thank all the participants to be so actively involved. And I would like to thank the whole IHE team, Maria, Nadine, Wim and Ger, who are there uh, in Delft with you. And I'd also like to announce that the next webinar will take place on March 6th. That will be on water diplomacy with Aaron Wolf and Zaki Schuber. Announcements will follow through the usual channels. And a recording of this webinar we will put online later today on the waterchannel.tv and will also be shared on through the, uh, through the IAG site, of course. And your presentation will be part of that as well. So thank you, everybody. And we hope to see you uh, on March 6 again. Thank you. Okay.